Welcome back, friends. I'm Annabelle, and I'm here to read. Now, usually we sit down and read a story together, and then we discuss it, but right now it is summer, so we all deserve a break. Especially me. So instead of our usual analysis and historical information, which I still did a little bit of it, and you can find it down in the video description box, we're just going to read a story together. Today we're reading The Enchanted Types by Frank L. Baum. One time, a nook became tired of his beautiful life and longed for something new to do. The nooks have more wonderful powers than any other immortal folk, except, perhaps, the fairies and rills. So one would suppose that a nook who might gain anything he desired by a simple wish could not be otherwise than happy and contented. But such was not the case with Po-Po-Po the nook we are speaking of. He had lived thousands of years and had enjoyed all the wonders he could think of. Yet life had become as tedious to him now as it might be to one who was unable to gratify a single wish. Finally, by chance, Popo Po thought of the earth people who dwell in cities, and so he resolved to visit them and see how they lived. This would surely be fine amusement and serve to pass away many wearisome hours. Therefore, one morning, after a breakfast so dainty you could scarcely imagine it, Popo Po set out for the earth and at once was in the midst of a big city. His own dwelling was so quiet and peaceful that the roaring noise of the town startled him. His nerves were so shocked that before he had looked around three minutes, he decided to give up the adventure and instantly returned home. This satisfied, for a time, his desire to visit the Earth cities, but soon the monotony of his existence again made him restless and gave him another thought. At night, the people slept, and the cities would be quiet. He would visit them at night. So, at the proper time, Popo Po transported himself in a jiffy to a great city, where he began wandering about the streets. Everyone was in bed. No wagons rattled along the pavements, no throngs of busy men shouted and hallowed. Even the policemen slumbered slyly, and there happened to be no prowling thieves abroad. His nerves being soothed by the stillness, Popo Po began to enjoy himself. He entered many of the houses and examined their rooms with such curiosity. Locks and bolts made no difference to a nook, and he saw as well as in darkness as in daylight. After a time, he strolled into the business portion of the city. Stores are unknown among the immortals, who have no need of money or of barter in exchange, so Popopo -Po was greatly interested by the novel sight of so many collections of goods and merchandise. During his wanderings, he entered a millinery shop and was surprised to see within a large glass case a great number of women's hats, each bearing in one position or another a stuffed bird. Indeed, some of the most elaborate hats had two or three birds upon them. Now, nooks are the especial guardians of birds and love them dearly. To see so many of his little friends shut up in a glass case annoyed and grieved Popopo, -po, who had no idea they had been purposely placed upon the hats by the milliner. So he slid back one of the doors of the case, gave a little chirping whistle of the nooks that all birds know well, and called, Come, friends, the door is open. Fly out. Popopo -po did not know the birds were stuffed. But, stuffed or not, every bird is bound to obey a nook's whistle and a nook's call. So they left the hats, flew out of the case, and began fluttering about the room. Oh, poor dears, said the kind-hearted nook. You long to be in the fields and forests again. Then he opened the outer door for them and cried, Off with you! Fly away, my beauties, and be happy again. The astonished birds at once obeyed, and when they had soared away into the night air, the nook closed the door and continued his wandering through the streets. By dawn he saw many interesting sights, but day broke before he finished the city, and he resolved to come by the next evening a few hours earlier. As soon as it was dark the following day, he came again to the city, and on passing the millinery shop, noticed a light within. Entering, he found two women, one of whom leaned her head upon the table and sobbed bitterly, while the other strove to comfort her. Of course, Popopo -po -po was invisible to mortal eyes, so he stood by and listened to their conversation. 
Cheer up, sister, said one. Even though your pretty birds have all been stolen, the hats themselves remain. Alas, cried the other, who was the milliner. No one will buy my hats partly trimmed, for the fashion is to wear birds upon them, and I, if I cannot sell my goods, I shall be utterly ruined. Then she renewed her sobbing, and the nook stole away, feeling a little ashamed to realize that in his love for the birds, he had unconsciously wronged one of the earth people and made her unhappy. This thought brought him back to the millinery shop later in the night when the two women had gone home. He wanted in some way to replace the birds upon the hats that the poor woman might be happy again, so he searched until he came upon a nearby cellar full of little gray mice, who lived quite undisturbed and gained a livelihood by gnawing through the walls into neighboring houses and stealing food from the pantries. Here are just the creatures, thought Popopo, to place upon the women's hats. Their fur is almost as soft as the plumage of the birds, and it strikes me the mice are remarkably pretty and graceful animals. Moreover, they now pass their lives in stealing, and were they obliged to remain always upon women's hats, their morals would be much improved. So he exercised a charm that drew all the mice from the cellar, and placed them upon the hats and glass case, where they occupied the places the birds had vacated and looked very becoming, at least in the eyes of the unworldly nook. To prevent their running about and leaving the hats, Popopo rendered them motionless, and then he was so pleased with his work that he decided to remain in the shop and witness the delight of the milliner when she saw how daintily her hats were now trimmed. She came in the early morning accompanied by her sister, and her face wore a sad and resigned expression. After sweeping and dusting the shop and drawing the blinds, she opened the glass case and took out a hat. But when she saw a tiny gray mouse nestling among the ribbons and laces, she gave a loud shriek, and dropping the hat, sprang with one bound to the top of the table. The sister, knowing the shriek to be one of fear, leaped upon a chair and exclaimed, "'What is it? Oh, what is it?' "'A mouse!' gasped the milliner, trembling with terror. Popopo, seeing this commotion, now realized that mice are especially disagreeable to human beings, and that he had made a grave mistake in placing them upon the hats, so he gave a low whistle of command that was heard only by the mice. Instantly, they all jumped from the hats, dashed out the open door of the glass case, and scampered away to their cellar. But this action frightened the milliner and her sister that, after giving several loud screams, they fell upon their backs on the floor and fainted away. Popopo was a kind-hearted nook, but on witnessing all this misery caused by his own ignorance of the ways of the humans, he straightway wished himself at home, and so left the poor women to recover as best they could. Yet he could not escape a sad feeling of responsibility, and after thinking upon the matter, he decided that since he had caused the milliner's unhappiness by freeing the birds, he could set the matter right by restoring them to the glass case. He loved the birds and disliked to condemn them to slavery again, but that seemed the only way to end the trouble. So he set off to find the birds. They had flown a long distance, but it was nothing to Popopo to reach them in a second, and he discovered them sitting upon the branches of a big chestnut tree and singing gaily. When they saw the nook, the birds cried, "'Thank you, Popopo! Thank you for setting us free!' Oh, do not thank me, returned the nook, for I have come to send you back to the millinery shop. Why? demanded a blue jay angrily, while the others stopped their songs. Because I find the woman considers you her property, and your loss has caused her much unhappiness, answered Popopo. But remember how unhappy we were in her glass case, said a robin redbreast, gravely. And as for being her property, you are a nook and the natural guardian of all birds, so you know that nature created us free. To be sure, wicked men shot and stuffed us and sold us to the milliner, but the idea of be our being her property is nonsense. Popo Po was puzzled. "'If I leave you free,' he said, "'wicked men will shoot you again, and you will be no better off than before.' "'Oh, pooh!" explained the blue jay. "'We cannot be shot now, for we are stuffed. "'Indeed, two men fired several shots at us this morning, "'but the bullets only ruffled our feathers and buried themselves in our stuffing. "'We do not fear men now.' "'Listen,' said Popopo sternly, "'for he felt the birds were getting the best of the argument.' 
The poor milliner's business will be ruined if I do not return you to her shop. It seems you are necessary to trim the hats properly. It is the fashion for women to wear birds upon their headgear, so the poor milliner's wares, though beautified by lace and ribbons, are worthless unless you are perched upon them. Fashions, said a blackbird solemnly, are made by men. What law is there among bird or nooks that requires us to be the slaves of fashion? What would we have to do with fashions anyway? screamed a linnet. If it were the fashion to wear nooks perched upon women's hats, would you be contented to stay there? Answer me, Po Po Po. But Po 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 was in despair. He could not wrong the birds by sending them back to the milliner, nor did he wish the milliner to suffer by their loss. So he went home to think about what could be done. After much meditation, he decided to consult the king of the nooks, and going at once to his majesty, he told him the whole story. The king frowned. This should teach you the folly of interfering with earth people, he said. But since you have caused all this trouble, it is your duty to remedy it. Our birds cannot be enslaved, that is certain. Therefore, you must have the fashions changed, so it will be no longer stylish for women to wear birds upon their hats." "'How shall I do that?' asked Popopo. "'Easily enough. Fashions often change among, among earth people who tire quickly of any one thing. "'When they read in their newspapers and magazines that the style is so-and-so, "'they never question the matter, but at once obey the mandate of fashion. "'So you must visit the newspapers and magazines and enchant the types.' "'Enchant the types?' echoed Popopo, in wonder. "'Just so. Make them read that it is no longer the fashion to wear birds upon hats.' That will afford relief to your poor milliner, and at the same time set free thousands of our darling birds who have been so cruelly used. Popopo thanked the wise king and followed his advice. The office of every newspaper and magazine in the city was visited by the nook, and then he went to other cities until there was not a publication in the land that had not a new fashion note in the pages. Sometimes Popopo enchanted the types so that whoever read the print would see only what the nook wished them to. Sometimes he called upon the busy editors and befuddled their brains until they wrote exactly what he wanted them to. Mortals seldom know how greatly they are influenced by fairies, nooks, and rills, who often put thoughts into their heads that only the wise little immortals could have conceived. The following morning, when the poor milliner looked over her newspaper, she was overjoyed to read that no woman could now wear a bird upon her hat and be in style, for the newest fashion required only ribbons and laces. Popopo, -po -po, after this, found much enjoyment in visiting every millinery shop he could find and giving new life to the stuffed birds which were carelessly tossed aside as useless. And they flew to the fields and forests with songs of thanks to the good nook who had rescued them. Sometimes a hunter fires his gun at a bird and then wonders why he did not hit it. But having read this story, you will understand that the bird must have been a stuffed one from some millinery shop, which cannot, of course, be killed by a gun. The End